and those of you who will watch this later on, we are uh, obviously in a stay-at-home order right now, so we have to do this um, all through social media, and we're grateful to have you this morning with us. Uh, today is um, a recognition of Palm Sunday. This is the triumphal entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem when um, the people shouted, Hosanna, um, great is the Lord, um, who, was, who was entering here, and they, they were dropping the palm branches, and you know, it was a really beautiful thing. Um, but uh, that was the lead-in to what would happen five days later where he died on the cross. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, um, would, uh, would pay the, the sin of all mankind. Well, there's a, that, that particular hill is called Calvary Hill, and that Jesus had to walk with a cross on his back and uh, to his own crucifixion. And the road to Calvary is what this is often referred to as. But what about the road that led to that road? And uh, what about all the events prior and leading up to this moment? It wasn't just about that week. It was about a lot more than that. It was actually, um, it stems back well further than we would ever have imagined. You see, there are prophecies that were given uh, that showed events paving the way to the cross and the subsequent empty tomb. How much time do we spend in reading, learning, and uh, potentially understanding what happened before all of this? When the major and the minor prophets of Israel told um, of the coming Savior and how he would and what he would go through before the end of his earthly life, they weren't vague about it. These were deliberate, direct, and specific details which cannot be misunderstood or taken away, uh, taken any other way. Um, that the only thing that can be taken away from any of these prophecies is that they were specific, leading up to this moment in history two thousand years ago. You see, Calvary didn't happen as a result of sin. It had to happen because of sin. Calvary was planned all along. God knew from the get-go that we wouldn't be able to withstand it. He knew the enemy would would do what he did to convince Eve. Uh, that taking the fruit off the tree was supposed to be done to help her mate. And she can't take all the blame because Adam certainly didn't flinch <laughs> when it was presented to him. Man was going to sin and God knew it. Man was going to need a Savior and so God provided. We are going to look next week at the resurrection, which is by far and away the most victorious occurrence in our history. Today we're going to show you uh, the many prophecies and events led, that led up to the crucifixion. And between these two weeks, we will ultimately show you the most beautiful interwoven story of glory only because God is so patient, so gracious, and so loving. Would you please pray with me this morning? Lord God, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for the opportunity that no matter uh, we're not able to congregate right now, Lord God, we know that we are still able to um, get together, gather together wherever we may be in one accord because the Spirit, your Spirit, Lord God, the Spirit of God is not about um, being in one building, although this is important, Lord God. We need to be in a building when we, when we can. We understand even more now than ever before uh, the importance of fellowship and the importance of being together like that. But while we can't do that, we are all together right now in one belief of you, Lord God. We pray that you would please open our ears to hear your words this morning, that you would open our eyes to, to see um, what it is, Lord God, that you have planned for us. Open our, our minds, Lord, to obviously receive the message this morning. And I pray now, Lord God, that I would um, remove myself, Lord, from a, a perspective that I, I can't get in your way. I pray, Lord God, you would speak by the way of the Holy Spirit through me, your vessel, to your children. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I have uh, seen a pretty funny meme this week, and it was, um, it was a church sign that showed the message, uh, prophecy class canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. Uh, that was pretty great, because that's about right. And it seems like many of us are asking questions about the current world situation and the pandemic, and wondering if the Bible laid this out for us to see. Uh, not specifically, but, but yeah, I mean, there was, there was a lot of things that occur that the, the Bible was never not specific in showing that these things would happen. There were plagues and there were wars and rumors of wars and, and there's desolation and destruction. But, you know, 
But we're also told not to fear. 365 times in the Bible we're told not to fear. Do not fear. Fear not. Why? Because ultimately God's completely in charge. And, and if when we haven't quite grasped that idea, that concept yet, it's not for us to fear, and we have to learn how to trust in Him. What is it about prophecies, though, coming to fulfillment that intrigues us so much? And we can all speculate, right? But allow me to retort with a question. With all of these prophecies made about our Savior Jesus Christ, why do we not talk about them more often? Why do we neglect the very promises made by the, the, the people in the Old Testament? Because, I mean, uh, think about this. Those prophecies are proven to have been hovering a long time before Christ, even. So just how long and what kind of prophecies came to pass? I'm going to show you three this morning before we move on to why these are important. Prophecy number one, Messiah would come from the line of Abraham. Genesis 22:17 17 through 18. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Who would be blessed? Those who would repent and believe. Believe in whom? Well, that's a reference to Jesus Christ, who we know now is the deliverer. How long ago was this prophecy? Around 1440 B.C., Uh, Genesis 22 was written by Moses in the biblical account of creation. Prophecy 2, Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5.2, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, of old, from ancient days. Coming from old, ancient days. That is only a reference to the Lord God. That's how they spoke at that time, referring to that. And Bethlehem, that tiny town, that would be like French Lick, Indiana, Carbondale, Kansas, being compared to, like, compared to New York City or, or Los Angeles. No one, I mean no one, would have ever predicted Bethlehem. Never. Wouldn't happen. And if you did, you would have been laughed at. Micah wrote this prophecy 500 years before it came to pass. Prophecy thir- three, number three, the third one. Messiah would be born of a virgin, Isaiah seven fourteen. Therefore the Lord himself would, will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall be conceived and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah wrote this prophecy 700 plus years before it came to pass. Now, do you think Isaiah would be slightly made fun of by his peers for claiming that Emmanuel, God with us, the, the coming Messiah, could come from a virgin? Oh, you ever so slightly. You better believe it. He got made fun of for that. Unless they knew the prophet was legit. And he was. These are specific prophecies on the birthplace of Christ, that he would come from the, the lineage, the line from Abraham, and the fact that he would be born of a virgin. Well, that's impossible. Yeah, it certainly would seem impossible. And yet it happened. And just as it was prophesied to happen, so the Israelites knew these prophecies, okay, they, be, because the laws, uh, uh, the, the laws given to them, the prophets that were given to them, all the prophecies that were given to them from the, in the Pentateuch and the Torah, they were written specifically for the nation of Israel because they were to be the keepers, the protectors, if you will, of the, what were, were known as the oracles of God, the words of God. And they knew this. They knew their history. They knew their word. They knew their promises. And they knew ultimately their commission was to protect the oracles. Sure, we, we would see in the book of Judges just how one um, generation, for instance, would embrace God only for the next generation to forget who God was and forget all the promises, blow them off, turn to sin, and then everything goes crazy. And, it, 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 and that book is a brutal reminder of just how messed up we can be as a people, amen? And we just went through the book of Judges the month before, before James, and it's difficult. It's difficult reading. There's a lot of bad stuff that happened in there. But we have to share it because that's the point. When we turn our hearts from God, we can see this. We can see it happening. Um, The nation of Israel um, protected, though, and they they honored and they carried forth the oracles of God, which is now known as the Old Testament. One day, however, these prophecies that were so very numerous, they were really all kind of in a, a pretty short period of time, a few hundred years of all of each other, would come to a screeching halt. And then all of a sudden, God would go quiet for 400 years. 
to be exact, a little over 400 years. Until just before Christ emerged from the wilderness, after his 40 days of being out, away from everything, prior to his ministry, a man named John would begin to prophesy about Messiah. He would begin to prophesy about the forthcoming Christ. He was different. He was very different. He was strange, to say the least. He would wear clothing made out of camel hair, and he would make his, his feast. He ate locusts and wild honey, which is the breakfast of champions. This man named John would be referred to as John the Baptist. And his bearing witness about Messiah would be the first anyone had heard from God in a very long, long time. Now, this was huge. Because all of the prophets from the Old Testament, from, from Isaiah to Habakkuk, from Amos to Joel, from Zechariah to, to Ezekiel, all those prophecies came to a screeching halt in this one prophet named Malachi. Now, why is Malachi so, so important? Why? It's a short, it's a short book. And it's right before the book of Matthew, which is New Testament. So it's put in its proper place. It was the last and final book of the Old Testament. You see, Malachi would give the nation of Israel their final warning around 400 B.C. He would tell them to straighten up or else. It was a really bleak picture painted um, for the nation of Israel. And I'm sure it was quite difficult hearing that their disobedience, their constant disobedience, had warranted the prophet to say something like this in Malachi 4, 1, 2, B. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when the, all the arrogant and all evildoers will stubble. Excuse me, will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. You ever read that before? But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. If through a prophet, God uses language like burning like an oven, the arrogant and the evildoers will burn, I'd be scared. And, and when he says that it will burn so hot that it will leave neither root nor branch, it makes you realize how God, angry, how, 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 how God was so angry that he would make a statement like this in the final chapter of Malachi, and then guess what? It goes quiet for 400 years. You ready for this? We've been a nation for 250 years almost, independently. And we, that kind of blows our head that we've been around so long. This is 400 years, folks. Just putting that into time perspective. We think linear Right? When we think of time, we think of linear time, but um, we have to realize this is a much bigger, uh, larger, and grander scheme. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. He's so angry, he's ready to crush them like with a one swift blow. But he says, but I'm going to hold off because I'm going to send Elijah the prophet. And he's going to come and he's going to testify. Now, this Elijah that Malachi was referring to, obviously he wasn't meaning Mal Elijah the, the, the prophet of old, but one like him, John the Baptist. And John would be prophesying about the Lord Jesus, who was in their midst. So he was here, and John was telling everyone that he was upon them. Check it out. He wore the same clothes, the weird camel hair clothing, leather belt. It was all like, like sitting to set him apart from everybody else because he was different indeed. But his words were amazing. You can read the account of John the Baptist and the birth of Christ being foretold in the book of Luke. But we're going to move to Luke uh, chapter 3, verse 3 through 6 this morning. And he went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it, was, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways. 
and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. We'll move to chapter 6 in a moment, but not yet. I just want you to be prepared. So if you are in the book of Luke and you're studying at home, just get to the 6th chapter and hold on a second. But I wanted to show you this from chapter 3, from verse, uh, verses 4b through um, 6. The, the old prophet from, from 700 years before, Isaiah, is quoted here. Okay, when he just laid out, he said, it just as, the, as Isaiah said, and he lays it out. If Isaiah was a whacked out, religious, some sort of a religious nut job, do you actually believe that his quote would be held as valid? No. If the entire nation of Israel thought that Isaiah was, was weird, so weird that they wouldn't listen to him, they wouldn't be studying him to this day. Now, never mind the fact that Isaiah was killed by his own people. We'll talk about that in a second. But the fact that later on we're like, okay, man, this guy is not like some, this is not some crazy, crazy man. This is an actual prophet, and they held to his, his words. Come on, time has proven that we, we don't adhere to anyone who's off the rocker. I mean, John the Baptist is indeed different. But he is preparing the way for Christ and quoting Isaiah the prophet. Why? Because everyone in their right mind in Israel knew that Isaiah was the man. They knew it. Everyone. Now Jesus starts his ministry just as foretold, um, it was foretold by the prophecies and the oracles given to the nation Israel. And he spends over three years um, teaching and preparing his disciples, right? He, he teaches them over a three-year period. He spends his ministry performing countless miracles and showing the people that it's not about being religious. It's about loving the Lord God um, first. You have to love him. You have to love God above everything else. And, and, and that, although that doesn't make sense to us because we love so many things in the world, he's teaching us how we have to start. Matthew 22, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You have to begin there. Love your neighbor as yourself. You have to start there. And then this is the progression of your life. All of a sudden, it's a pattern and an emulation to get somewhere else. We have to pattern and emulate our lives after him. Not in an attempt of being holy. You guys, it's not about being religious. It never has been. That's what mankind likes to do is be religious. It's not. It's about being submissive to the only Savior who has ever existed. To be submissive uh, uh, in a way to know that without Him we can do nothing. And that is what He taught. Jesus set the trend differently. He did things differently. He raised a man that was been dead for four days from the dead. He raised him. Who does that? Nobody, nobody can do that. He did that. Why? Because he was showing everybody that he was the promised Messiah. You see, he would, he would know, though, that we would wonder what this life is all about. He would know that we would struggle with our lives. He knew this. He knew it. So this is what he tells us in, in Luke chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. While the prophets were taken serious by a lot of the nation, and many were treat, not treated very well. In fact, many of them were killed by their own people. How do we know this? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 and 15, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displeased God, and opposed all mankind. Those are some strong words from Paul. And the Old Testament um, tells us of what happens to a lot of them. The prophet Jeremiah was martyred by stoning Isaiah, who we were just talking about, who we're going to quote from again here in a moment, was sawed in half. He was sawn in half. Amos and Micah were both martyred by their own countrymen. Knowing this, Jesus addresses the religious folks of the day in Matthew 23. Matthew 23. I want you to pull up Matthew 23 because we're going to read two sections out of that. So if you've got that at home, if not, you'll see it on your screen. Matthew 23, 27, and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly 
appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Christ's reference to the scribes and the Pharisees allows for an easy transition to this final warning in a moment. Um, though the religious leaders think that they are honoring the prophets when, when they build and embellish tombs and monuments, right? They're, they're erecting these, these beautiful tombs, and they're actually acknowledging themselves as being in the league with those who actually killed the holy men, as Jesus goes on to say in verses 29 and 31. But in Jesus' day, a period known as the Second Temple Judaism, there were, uh, was a boom in monument construction, and these structures were intended to pay tribute to the prophets of old. The same prophets they killed, they still are now erecting monuments and building things for. They were also supposed to, to point out the piety of the builders, who in building meant to show that they, have, they would have obeyed the prophets their forefathers actually condemned. Yet, in Jesus, they rejected Him. And rejecting Jesus... By the way, the par, the, the par excellence of any historical prophet. These men allied themselves with their wicked ancestors. In fact, they were worse than their forefathers because in Christ they saw truth more clearly. He showed them more clearly. Isaiah could have gave a, 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 a prophecy which had not come in fulfillment, so they were like, who's born of a virgin, right? When later on, we now look at Isaiah and we're like, Man, the guy knows what he's talking about. But I mean, like, read John 1, 17 and 18, because Jesus' woe, Jesus woe tells us that the scribes and Pharisees would have happily buried the prophets just as they gleefully sought to kill and bury Christ Jesus. Why? Why would they do this? Why would they literally want to kill someone who was simply trying to help them? Why, why would they do this? And if you just step back from, from your mindset for a second, because you, you, you build, if you have very little understanding of Christianity, you're all right. So we're all there at some point. Uh, many of us are there now. We struggle with understanding why, you know, because we, we see, um, we see a, ch a church here in Topeka on the west side of town make famous news worldwide because of their picketing rituals. And we think that, oh, there you go, that's Christians. Or we see somebody like um, a prosperity gospel teacher who, um, who, who has a, a million, multi-million dollar mansion. And that's what we think all tithing goes to. Look, man, uh, newsflash everybody, but that is not Christianity. That's an abomination of Christianity. That is, that is an absolute um, malignment of it. We, we, we don't look at those as the standard. We, as believers, look at those as the uh, as the abominations of what we believe. Because humility is the opposite of riches. And, and, and love is the opposite of hatred, which I just aforementioned before. We have to look at this differently. So if you can step out of what you think you believe Christianity and Jesus Christ is about, just step out for a minute and hear me out. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you read all four of those or any four of those, and you just cumulatively bring together a understanding, a, 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 some sort of a semblance of understanding of who Jesus actually was and is. You will see somebody who loved everybody who couldn't be loved and hated those who were overly religious. I got nothing after that. So why, why would we just, why would we want to put this man to death? Why would we want to put this man to death on a cross? Why would we do it? Because that's what we do in history. Well, you, you look at the, the guys who wanted to bring peace to the Middle East, regardless of their religion or religious affiliation. Look at Gandhi. How about Sadat? Nobody ever talks about Sadat. The guy's um, killed in 1981 by assassination from the Muslim Brotherhood. He just, people didn't like him, and he was just trying to bring peace to the Middle East. This is what we do. But those two were men. Those two I just mentioned were men. Jesus Christ was the perfect, ultimate prophet, priest, and king. He was the, in, the, in the line of the order of Melchizedek. He was the perfect um, uh, culmination of everything that we could never get to through religion. He was perfect. The Savior of all nations, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Glory to God. And His mission on this earth is the most widespread, most impactful mission of any single human being in history. And I say human because He was human in flesh. He was God incarnate. 
Yes, he was God in human flesh. He wasn't just a human picked by God. It was planned all along because he was there from the formation of the world, which nobody ever talks about anymore. Near the end of his life, though, he verbally obliterates the overly religious with his warnings of forthcoming destruction. In Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, ends with these words. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones though those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then he goes into explaining the destruction of the temple that was going to happen and the destruction of Jerusalem, which both occurred in A.D. 70. Historically proven, that was ransacked, buildings destroyed in the next chapter in 24. He never spoke about the nation becoming a, a state again like it did in 1948. He never said anything about that. When he talked about being the temple, the temple would be, um, uh, he would destroy the temple and raise it in three days. He was not talking about a building. He was talking about his bodily temple. Never did Jesus speak about a third temple building being built in Israel. And he never talked about it. He never clamored for it. And, and they're, they're clamoring for it now and they're building it now. Look, they can do all that they want to, but it didn't have anything to do with the words of Christ. He never spoke about it. Read it. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and if you disagree with me, anytime call me. He warned the nation would be destroyed and desolate for what it had done and what it was preparing to do. And what was that? That was to put him on a cross and crucify him. They had stoned and killed every, every prophet before him. And they were going to do the same to him. And this is why his warning should speak volumes now, just as it did to those who would follow him. We are at a time now where we have evangelical preachers teaching nonstop that the church will be whisked away before any kind of tribulational period. When it was our Savior who promised that we would suffer for believing in him. We have people all around the world who are brutally being murdered for their faith in Christ. But it's okay, the church will be taken away before that happens. Matthew 24, 9 through 14. Just hear me out. Look at what Jesus said here. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then, and then the end will come. Our Savior gave us fair warning, but he also gave us reprieve. He gave us comfort in these times because this isn't it. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms, right? We're leaning on the everlasting arms. You're like, man, but I really want to get to retirement here and I want to travel. Okay, do what you, you're going to do. I don't know what to tell sometimes when people are like so worried about this life being the only thing. And I'm just telling you, just carefully reconsider that. I'm telling you with every fiber of my being, I stand before you right now and tell you that I am not worried about how I'm going to die or when I'm going to die. Those aren't loose words. I don't care how it happens or when it happens. I know it's going to happen and I'm totally okay with that. Why? Because I know the promises of my father in this word, when he promises us right here in the scripture of what's to come. And if you don't want to believe in that, dude, no problem. I'm not forcing your hand at that. You never are forcing anybody's hand. But if they don't know, they don't know. I didn't know at one point in my life about this. I didn't understand it. But God brings this to the head. He brings us. This. this is why we share the gospel. This is why we are to, called to make disciples. What's a disciple? It's somebody who loves and emulates Jesus Christ. It's somebody who you bring along and help them to become uh, better human beings as best as they can be. Are they human? Yes. But are they, are, you know, are they, are they able to be molded and shaped? you darn right they are. And I, I'm so grateful that God is able to, to use somebody, even a, a, sap, a sorry sap like me. 
I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be able to share his word because it means so much to me. And nothing else means as much to me as this. But he gave us a reprieve. And you think that you're going to die and come back as a human, another human or a flower or something? You believe whatever you want. Go ahead. I'm, I'm not even chastising you. I'm not. But I'm asking you to strongly reconsider. And if you think that nothing happens when you die, you just return to dust and you're done. And that's, all, that's it and that's over. Well, if, if that's what you believe, and you are free to believe what you want to believe. But I'm asking you to strongly reconsider. It wasn't long after the final teachings that Jesus had supper with his disciples. It was a celebration of the Passover meal. And the Passover meal is a big celebrated Jewish custom of celebrating how God spared the Israelites' firstborn child during the final plague that swept Egypt when the Jews were enslaved at the end of their 400 years of, of enslavement to, to Egypt and the Pharaoh. But instead of, 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 of the traditional meal that they used when they painted the red blood of the lamb over the doorway, and every one of them were passed by, and then Pharaoh's son, his firstborn, dies. He's so angry and distraught. He's like, that's it. I'm done with these plagues. I'm done with this. Just go. And then they leave. And then anger brews in him, and he goes, and he's like, nah, that, that, that's not it. I'm going to make him pay and punish them, pe- punish them for this. I'm going to make him pay. He gets all his armies and go, and we all know what happened there. Red Sea splits. The, Egypt- the Israelites come through. The Egyptians follow suit. Water closes in on them, kills them. But the plague was the final thing. That, that red painted door. This is a big festival. This is a big celebration for the Jewish people. So Passover meal meant everything. This is how they were broken from the bond of slavery. Of 400 years. 400. 400. Instead of the traditional meal, Jesus explained that, uh, uh, that all of what had happened to that nation, though, however would come to fulfillment in him. He would explain to them that he was the fulfillment of the promised, he was the promised you know, Messiah. He was the fulfillment of all these pro- prophecies before him. <coughs> Excuse me. That he was the purpose of the Abrahamic covenant. That all the Old Testament prophecies were types and shadows all to get to Jesus Christ and not some future point in time. That the oracles of God were fulfilled right here, right now, at this moment in history, 2,000 years ago. At this Passover feast, which came to be known later as the Last Supper, Judas gets up from the table and he goes off to sell Jesus out to the Sanhedrin, which Jesus told them about a year and two prior, and then tells them about at the table. It was all part of a plan. What kind of a plan would, would make you hang on a cross? I'll get to that in a moment. But he said it would happen. And it was the same meal that Jesus sat down and washed the feet of his brothers. Sit down, let me wash your feet. And every one of them are going through and they're kind of tripping out because Jesus is washing their feet and drying off their feet and they go sit down at the table. It was a custom. It was a customary thing. Um, And then Peter stands up and says, you're not washing my feet. You're not washing my feet. And the Lord says, sit down, let me wash your feet. And Peter's like, indignant you're not going to wash my feet lord you know you, we worship and we we serve you you're you're the you're the messiah you're the promised messiah I'm, you're not going to wash my feet because that's what we do in society we elevate everybody right but jesus says sit down let me wash your feet otherwise you can have no part in me have you ever stopped to think about the moment of humility that jesus took upon himself to show us what that meant Why did Jesus say this to Peter? Because he wanted his young disciple to understand humility in the largest way. Humbling ourselves before others is not stooping low. It is showing that no one, and I mean no one, is above you. And why is this important? It's, it, it's because this is how we think as a society and a culture. We always think about who's elevated, who's at the top of the food chain, who's, who's CEO of this or president of that, and it doesn't matter. Nobody 
is above us. Not to say that we don't respect people who are in charge. That's the order of things. We have to have a, a boss. We have to have a jefe, right? We have to have somebody who, who gives us instruction and they lead. And, and preferably they're a believer so they can lead by example and not be a jerk because we don't need that in life. We have enough of that. So, you know, all these things happen after that. We can l- learn all about that later. But I'm just telling you right now that when it comes from a heart and intentional standpoint, stooping low is not what he was doing. He was hum- humbling himself before Peter, showing him that you're never above anybody else and if you don't think that this was important jesus taught humility right here because we learn later that that peter would have a momentary lapse of of reason um and and later on he was yucking it up with the jewish high ups at one point in the new testament and disregarding the lowly brothers and sisters and brother paul has to call him out in front of other people and to reel him back in so if it wasn't for this moment of jesus washing the feet of his disciples and telling peter that he was not above anybody else Peter would not have had the benchmark for his memory to serve him at this moment. So now Peter looks back and he's like, when Paul calls him out, he might not have liked it, but he got to thinking about it. He's like, yeah, yeah. This is why our experiences are paramount to our growth in our lives. We learn lessons. We go through difficult moments. But how do we come out of those? Isn't that kind of up to you? Isn't your experience, how you deal with that experience, up to you? Well, after the Last Supper, Jesus is arrested and delivered up to Pontius Pilate, who would try to let Jesus go free because he had found no fault in him. And Pilate, then who would ask Jesus? He pulls him off the side. He says, "Um, are you a king, as they say? And Pilate looks at him um, intently, and he's waiting for this answer. And Jesus looks at him, and he says, my kingdom is not of here. It's not of this world. Pilate doesn't get that. There was nothing else for Jesus to do at this point but allow the Father, the will of the Father to now take place because how and why would he even need to explain himself to Pilate? He doesn't have to. My kingdom is not of this world. Pilate even attempted to allow the crowd to release Jesus, but instead they would set free a a known social monster known as Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate was trying, but... He didn't, he wasn't man enough to stand up and just release him because it wasn't part of the plan. It would all come to pass when they made Jesus out to be a criminal and a criminal who would be literally innocent. And at this point that Jesus just shuts down and Pilate would literally wash his hand of innocent blood in front of everybody and dries his hands off and then releases him to the Jews. But not, not before Jesus was, was, was drug off whipped, beaten, scourged, and, and, and humiliated by Roman soldiers who would then hand him back over to the Jewish people, his fellow countrymen, who would mock him and spit on him and ridicule him. And here, uh, here's where he would pick up the cross. And, 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 and he would pick it up in total fulfillment of, of him, his own prophecy in Luke 9.23 when he said, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, then let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And Jesus knew this prophecy would come to fulfillment. That's why he carried this cross up onto Calvary Hill. Because he knew that we would have to endure such horrible things. That's why he told us we would. He knew that no matter what it is, sometimes people go go through their whole life, not experience a lot of rocky rocky waters, you know, maybe just some stress over bills and maybe a relationship breakup or something, and then they they, they die. And, you know, but but who knows what's going on in them, right? But I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about anybody, anybody who's listening to this right now. You can look at me and tell me that your life has been peaches and cream your entire life and you have nothing to worry about. I want to meet you and I want to shake your hand. As soon as the social distancing six foot thing is over with, I want to shake your hand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wide open. I didn't even mean to walk into that one. But I seriously want to shake your hand because how did you do it? I want you to write a book. I want you to write a book. on how Because that's not possible. We all go through bad things. We all go through a very difficult time in, in our lives at some point. And in fact, many of us, a lot of times, we go through difficult stuff. How do we deal with it afterwards? Well, Jesus knew that this prophecy would come to fulfillment, and he knew exactly what it was that we would be going through. So I want, I want to read you something, and I want to read this from uh, Isaiah 53, 7 through 12. Ready for this? He knew that it was the only way to fulfill what was told to us in this prophecy. As you see the picture at home, you're going to see a picture of Christ carrying the cross uphill, and people are swinging at you, swinging at him, and they're, and they're spitting on him, and, they're, and they're, making, they're humiliating him. 
And he says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This was written 700 years before Jesus. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Exactly. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears um, is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he has, was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was num numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. What does intercessing mean? Intercession is prayer. The only way for him to become the intercessor, the, the, the priest, the ultimate priest, so that we no longer need a human priest um, Jewish or any other form of uh, modern day installment of what we think a priest uh, should be. Um, a shepherd should be a leader, but not somebody who takes all the sins for you. That is what Jesus Christ died on the cross for. That's what he resurrected from the grave for. That's what he ascended into heaven for, to be our permanent, perfect intercessor. So when we pray, we pray through Jesus to get to God. Why? Because he did that. He earned that. And we don't quite understand that, and I'm not asking you to. I'm not asking your head to process that and put it into a file cabinet. I'm just asking you to hear the words I'm telling you. This is why he died. You see, it was at this moment in history when all of history came to fulfillment in him on the cross. As he's walking up Calvary Hill with this big wooden cross on his back, where at the end of the road up Calvary Hill would come the completion in the spirit spotless lamb, the sinless, blameless man who would take uh, on every one of our sins onto his shoulders, um, the weight of the world into those nails and onto the crown of thorns that was pierced into him onto that cross. The road to Calvary was not sudden. It wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't something that was done uh, spur of the moment because, oh man, everything was bad. Now we got to send, I got to send my son up the hill. It was all planned. Calvary happened because God knew it would happen because it had to happen. Calvary happened because we would never be able to sit, stay in life without him apart from him. This is why it happened. Psalm 22, I close with this. This is what Jesus cries out on the cross. He says, Elohim, Elohim, lamech sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did he cry that out? Because it's a song. So as you look now at a picture um, of Jesus Christ on the cross with the crown of thorns buried into his head, very gruesome, very difficult to look at, I want you to hear this. My God, my God, why uh, have you forsaken me? Which everybody then in the crowd knows what he's singing. They begin to sing it out. Why are you so far from from saving me, from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. You, you, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Written 1,000 plus years before this moment occurred in history where Jesus cries out the lyrics to this psalm. Amazing. You see, the prophecies of the Old Testament were fulfilled in him, and now we await the final, ultimate fulfillment with his return. Don't call me religious because I'm not. Actually, you can feel free to do so, but I'm not. I make a horrible religious man. But you may call me a Jesus freak because I am. I'm in love with a Savior that died for me and I didn't deserve it. 
I'm in love with a Savior who, who I, I was such a wretched man, and I'm still working through my problems. And he loved me enough to think about me 2,000 years ago on that cross. Who does that? I know that I am free from the bondage of slavery to sin because of him who died for me on that cross that day, on that moment in Calvary, and the road that left up to it, that led up to this moment, was huge and a long time in the making. Would you please pray with me this morning? I do not know or nor understand, Lord, why you are so amazing. You know, when we think about the... Um, as I made a comment, Lord God, in that sermon about the, the, the things that we, the people and the things and the, and the actions of other people who claim to be Christian, you can claim you're a Christian all day long, but you are only known by the fruit of what would come out of a natural person in an unnatural way. You see, a natural person would not have um, a great deal of love and kindness and gentleness. A natural person wouldn't. But a person, Lord God, who you have touched and that you have changed begins to show and emulate the fruit of the Spirit in a different way than we can ever understand or even imagine. We're all still spotted with, with stains from this world. We're all still human beings. But you have done an amazing, amazing feat to take on every single sin and burden upon your shoulders onto that cross. And next week, Lord God, we're going to learn about something much, much more victorious. As today we talk about the very bleak moment in history when you died on that cross, next week we will talk about the triumphal, amazing moment of what you've done for us. Lord, we come before you and anybody here this morning who has heard this message or anybody going forward, whoever hears this message and who has never given their lives to you, Lord God, or surrendered their lives to you. They don't understand. It's not about walking down an aisle and stamping a passport. It's about or getting a, a yellow ribbon, Lord God. It's about truly surrendering their lives to you. And at this moment, Lord God, we don't always know what that looks like, but we, we don't want to carry our burden of our sin any longer. We ask of you to forgive us of our sins and, and, and make us new. Your, your, new your, your word tells us, the New Testament tells us to, um, to just repent and believe, and that's what we do today. We repent of our sins and believe in you. In your precious, holy, perfect name, we give you the glory, Lord God. Amen.